Hello everyone, my name is PJ, and welcome to The Void. So, apparently, I done fucked up. I have over 950 videos on my other channel, and none of them, I checked, have as many dislikes as my review of Final Fantasy XI. So even though I consider it my magnum opus in terms of video creation, it is, technically speaking, the worst thing I've ever made. Uh, but in all seriousness, the feedback I've gotten for the review has been incredibly positive and constructive for the most part. There are some who agree with my points, and many who politely disagree. I expected an angrier and far more toxic backlash for this video, so kudos internet, we've come a long way since 4chan. This video is basically a review of my FF11 review. I'm going to go over all the points I made and say what should have been said about them in the first place. When I wrote that review, I wasn't doing so in a calm, analytical manner like a reviewer should. I was clouded with emotions and a pressing desire to just be done with all aspects of the game as soon as possible. Which is why I'm making yet another video about it, I guess. <coughs> okay, so the first category was graphics. No one really had anything to say about that, so I guess people agreed with the points I made? I don't know. I also neglected to mention this crazy bug with Ildenarch's eye patch. Don't know why that's there. But since the graphics are neither great nor awful, the bonus remains a plus zero. Same for music. I mean, the game has good music. No arguments there, the plus one stands. Now, gameplay was when shit hit the fan. Let's talk about some key points I made here and there, and maybe discuss why they exist in the first place and how we might fix them. First, I want to elaborate on the job system that I only offhandedly mentioned. While it's true that jobs level separately, a huge aspect of it is the ability to have sub-jobs. For example, the jobs I used to beat the final boss were Runefencer with Samurai as the sub. Having it as a sub means I get access to all the abilities and traits granted by the first half of that job's levels. For Samurai, that means getting access to its innate store TP traits, allowing the gauge to fill more quickly during combat. Finding the right sub-job is actually a big part of the combat, and I stupidly neglected this little nuance until I needed to learn about it. That's another thing I should admit, is that as time went on, I started rushing through the game more and more. I knew how long the game would take, and as the fear of it taking even longer surfaced, so too did my desperation to finish it. That was probably a huge contributing factor in my not having as much fun with it toward the end. But the point I was trying to make before is that FF11 does have a really good job system. With how fast leveling is now, it's totally feasible to get every job to level 49 and have them all available as subs. It also has a decent system for gaining XP, very similar to how D&D does it. Although it's kind of weird that a level 75 dragon and a level 75 bunny rabbit will give you the exact same amount of XP, but it is what it is. Next, the excessive walking. Early in the game's life, the default walking speed used to be slower, half as fast. Why did they raise it? Well, because they realized it was too slow. It's that simple. The current walking speed isn't horrible, but it's ill-suited given the size of the game's areas. I would often turn on auto-walk while steering with my left hand and browsing the internet with my right. You can't read signs or talk to NPCs on mounts. Why not? If I had to guess the reason, it's probably because examining things often triggers cutscenes and they didn't want to bother remembering, unloading, and reloading your mouth for them. Even the signs in Jugna Forest are involved in a quest. Okay, that's fine, so you can't examine things while mounted for programming reasons, I guess? But why then is there a cooldown timer for calling mounts? Is it so that you can't get off your mount, grab something while a monster's not looking, and then get back on immediately? You can already do that. The timer can recharge while you're safe on the mount. I'm not sure what the reason for this is. If the issue involves loading times, I doubt it needs a whole minute, maybe 10 seconds? The quests in this game do not give you enough direction. No, I don't want giant green markers in the sky telling me where to go like in FF14. I just want the game to tell me what to do. I can't count how many missions in this game where I read the walkthrough and thought, how is anyone supposed to figure that out? For example, 
There are a number of early missions in Seekers of Audelin that cannot be accessed until you've either gained enough fame or spent enough of a currency called Imprimators, but the game does not tell you this, and even if you know to do this and know how to do it in the fastest way possible, it still takes a long time. I'm guessing the intent was not for players to do that as fast as possible and to just explore Audelin completing side quests until the NPC that normally does nothing suddenly lets them progress. And by then, you've forgotten what happened in the early cutscenes of the storyline and will be lost and it picks up again. And that's just one example. Some quests would be like, go get me this item, and nothing in the game will tell you where to find it. You might have to just examine some random stump out in the woods that normally does nothing, but now summons a mini-boss you had to defeat in order to get the item. Assuming you examine the stump quickly enough after beating the enemy, which doesn't just drop it upon death for some reason. And why are so many mission points invisible? Some of them look like little glowing lights, so why not make that the standard appearance for all of them? I really can't think of a good reason for them to be invisible, other than to make finding them slightly more impossible. The only way to find them is to constantly hit left and right while walking. I get why maps don't show some geographical elements when you first buy them, but we could fix the maps so that they update with walls and secret rooms when you find them. Kind of like a fog of war effect. They are supposed to be magical maps after all, and if not for that reason, then maybe your character is just drawing on them? I know I'd amend all of my maps if I were an adventurer. Fix it so that tiny ledges and slopes don't act as invisible walls. I don't think this was intentional, just a geometric oversight. Quests that require you to zone in from specific adjoining areas, I do get the intent behind. The implication is that your character traveled to that area on foot from where the previous quest took place. But this doesn't typically happen anymore since players will almost always teleport. I say, just remove that requirement. Make it so the cutscene plays when you zone in via any means. Fix the Sahagin key quest so it doesn't reset when you leave the area. Also, display a timer for timed quests. Battlefields have them, so normal quests should too. In the review, I compared the game's way of making things take too long to freemium games. I called it a shady tactic and want to apologize for that. Another example of my emotions getting in the way. Some people like to believe the overly cryptic and convoluted nature of the quests is to give them some kind of unique atmosphere or some other flowery feeling, but I disagree. I still think it's to get more monthly subscription fees, which, to be fair, are the only reason the game is still going. It's the most profitable thing Square has ever made, after all. Make it easier to hit enemies and initiate combat when you're literally on their heels. Also, it would be nice if any form of offense other than melee attacks would make your trusts join in, like casting fire or shooting an arrow. Everyone seems to agree that the auto-targeting sucks. How it should work is when I kill an enemy, my target should automatically switch to the nearest aggroed enemy, whether or not they're on screen. If I want to put my weapon away, I'll select the disengage option. People also agree about animation locking. That sucks too. When I started playing this game, I was really looking forward to some epic boss fights, especially with the Shadow Lord. But the first time I fought him was with my friends, who all level synced to me, I was level 50 at the time, and we somehow crushed him in seconds. I was going to upload a video of the fight, but it was so sad and disappointing that I deleted it immediately. When I fought him again for the other two nations, I did so with lower and lower levels until I got the challenge I came for. But holding off on leveling would not be a viable option for long, so I ended up crushing every future boss in the game up until Seekers of Adelin, escort missions notwithstanding. I was very happy to learn later, after the review was already done unfortunately, that all the major story bosses could be refought at higher levels, which was how I got the footage from my top 10 songs video. Finally, I got the challenge I wanted from those fights just wish it could have happened during the story and not after the fact, I think I'd prefer an optional level cap for earlier story bosses, so even level 99 players can have those epic climaxes when doing the story. Everyone agrees that TP being wasted on moving targets is also pretty shitty. 
But that reminds me of something else I wanted to talk about, which is weapon skill quests. Every weapon type has a number of weapon skills that are learned automatically as your skill level with that weapon goes up with use, but some skills can only be gotten from quests. These quests require you to equip a special weapon of that category, and then go out into the world using weapon skills and skill chains in order to gain weapon skill points. The game does not tell you how many points you have, how many you need, or how many you earn for performing certain actions. It's all hidden, and I really can't think of a good reason as to why. Windower has a command that lets you see how many points the weapon currently has, but otherwise you just have to keep earning points until the weapon's latent effect disappears, which isn't always obvious. Why can't trusts be given manual commands? In the cutscenes where you receive them, they are shown to be perfectly sentient and cognizant of others' words and actions. Pets and summons can be given commands, but I don't see why trusts can't. Also, trusts should absolutely start fighting back if one of them gets attacked. It doesn't make sense for them to just stand there and let themselves get killed. The line where I mentioned trusts not being able to keep up with you? I'll be honest, that only happened a few times, mostly in Race and Jima. I think they were getting stuck in the bamboo thickets. I guess I was just upset that I got killed once because my trust was suddenly miles behind me. Why do I have to be in range to dismiss trusts? If one of my trusts gets stuck somewhere and I can't reach them, then I can't dismiss them. They should really fix that. The part where I say, aw, that's adorable, to the audience, is really cringy and arrogant in hindsight, and I apologize for that. No one complained about it specifically, and some people even told me they found it funny, but I still hate that I did that. Charm is still awful. There's no way to become immune to it, and not many ways to build resistance to it either. It's probably not a big deal in parties full of actual humans, though. True sight enemies? I don't have an excuse for this one. I think I was just looking for more to complain about. True sight enemies are fine. They're not even that big of a deal if you remember to summon your trust before going invisible. People are surprisingly divided about the death mechanics. Some think having all these punishment ultimatums gives death more meaning, while others agree that death is quite unnecessarily brutal. After giving it some thought, even the XP loss upon returning to your home point is worth keeping, as it prevents players from using death as a free homework. But there is one thing I'd change, and that's to give resurrected players 5 to 10 seconds of invincibility and zero enmity. Just enough time to get away from the enemies and keep the rays from being a waste. Even with these amendments, the bad still vastly outweighs the good in my eyes, so I'm keeping the minus one for the gameplay category. Everyone loves the story, so of course it's getting a plus one, but we're gonna come back and talk about it a little more later. One thing I didn't mention that involves the story, but is something better reserved for the presentation category, is how awful and tedious it is to re-watch cutscenes. There are two ways to do so. In towns, you have to talk to a minstrel, but out in the field, you have to trade one gill to an invisible pair of goblin footprints. Every area with cutscenes has one or the other, and each one will only let you re-watch cutscenes that played in that area, including fragments of cutscenes that were originally multiple parts. It can take hours to re-watch just a few minutes of cutscenes in their intended order with all the running around between areas you have to do, and some goblin footprints are really difficult to reach, like the ones in Arzadal Ruins. I'm guessing the reason they did this is because they didn't want to have to load new areas for all the cutscenes, since almost none of them are pre-rendered. But I still wish that there was just like a theater somewhere where you can watch all the cutscenes in the game that you've seen without having to travel anywhere else. I said that Square said that they were planning on getting rid of Play Online for years and hadn't done it yet. What I was actually thinking of, because it's been a long time and I didn't check my sources, was the time Square made logging in easier by merging everyone's Play Online accounts with their Square Enix accounts. It was the Play Online accounts that they got rid of, not Play Online itself. Apparently, Play Online can't be done away with for some reason, so feel free to ignore what I said but the weighty login process is still unfavorable. Cutscenes are unskippable, and that is a huge problem, but apparently they can never be made skippable due to how they're rendered and flagged. Whatever the reason, the fact is they are still unskippable and that's no good. 
Some people disagreed with my statement on the organization of the menus, but I stand by what I said. The records of Eminence submenus are especially unintuitive. There are two currency buttons in the main menu for some reason, both of which are ridiculously long and aren't easy to sort through, and it's not obvious at first that you can hit left and right to access the second half of the main menu. Why not just have a little blinking arrow next to it? I also don't think it's explained anywhere that you can equip items while they're in storage. You can wear clothes that you don't have on your person and swap them out at any time? I couldn't believe it was possible when I first figured out it could be done, but yeah, the menu thing is just a difference in opinion. I can't make a solid case against it, but I did struggle with the menus for the first few months of my experience. And these tiny three line boxes? Still awful. Speaking of records of eminence, there's another new and major feature that I never mentioned. From your quests menu, you can now manually flag quests, some of which are repeatable, in order to earn bonus XP, items, and a new currency called Sparks. Keeping the right records active can really speed up the leveling process until you get the Rhapsody key items that permanently boost XP gain. I bring this up because I saw one person make a good suggestion on how to improve it and make inventory management easier. Most of the rewards you get are things that can be exchanged for currency, like Esha silt pouches, elemental crystals, copper vouchers, and more. They can fill your inventory without you realizing it, and you'll have to fiddle with the menus later to gather any rewards that are still in queue. The suggestion was to make all of those items into currency themselves, so they don't take up inventory space. I tell ya, that would be especially helpful for elemental crystals. I don't know why the only automatic sorting method is based on item IDs, or whatever method it's using. There's no alphabetization option, no sort by category or quantity options. The only way to sort them properly is to do it manually, and pff, fuck that noise. Do you know how hard it is to swap two containers items when they're both full? I actually had a list I was keeping track of for most of the game where I would record what an item was what quests or missions I might need it for, which storage container to keep it in, and whether or not to sell or discard it. The list was in alphabetic order and had several hundred items on it. When I finally gave up my ridiculous dream of mastering all the crafting guilds, I cleared up a lot of inventory space getting rid of crafting materials. Long story short, managing your inventory is like its own little side quest that never ends. It's still a problem. Switching between maps can be made easier two ways. One, allow for the option to sort areas by expansion instead of region, like you can do with home points and survival guides. Two, make the maps for your current area more immediately accessible so you don't have to go hunting for them. For presentation, I'll be keeping the plus zero, especially now at the method of re-watching cutscenes out in the open. Now, the first miscellaneous point was one of the most controversial of all, and that was my rant on chocobo racing. A question I got asked a lot was, why did I give the score a minus one just because I didn't like a side quest? I apologize if I didn't make it clear enough, but the fun factor of chocobo racing was not the reason for the deduction. It's the fact that it's a three month side quest with no rewards. Chocobo raising used to have rewards. For one, it was the only way to get your own mount before the other mounts were introduced. You could call your chocobo anytime you wanted without having to rent one. You could also participate in chocobo racing, back when I'm assuming it was still a popular activity. But now, there are better, cooler, more easily obtained mounts, and the chocobo racing community is dead. There's no point in raising a chocobo anymore, so if you spend three months doing it hoping to unlock something amazing, you're gonna be horribly disappointed just like I was. That is why it lowers the score. Chocobo raising can be easily fixed though. Just make it so that there's some sort of unique reward for owning your own chocobo that's useful to everyone, something other than chocobo hot and cold which I never got anything good from. Maybe shortcuts through areas that only chocobos can traverse, maybe like going over mountains or over rivers. High level chocobo themed gear. Or maybe just make chocobos faster than all the other mounts. Anything is better than nothing. The second miscellaneous point covers repeating missions after failing a boss. 
Some people were confused that I singled out the mission before the scene crystal, which is called Banishing the Echo for ease of reference. This is a really difficult mission, but it's really not that bad. If it was so horrible, I wouldn't have done it a fourth time when gathering footage for the review. I even managed to do it that time without getting caught once, though it still took half an hour. The reason I lowered the score at this point was because I had to repeat the mission twice and not because I was being punished for failing a challenge, but because, like I mentioned in the review, the seed crystal bugged out on me. I uploaded the entire video on my other channel, but basically what happens is I approach the boss, get warped inside of the boss, and I'm then unable to move or initiate the fight. It even happened on my second attempt when I tried to hit it with a spell from range. I eventually learned that the bug could be circumvented by disengaging, but it was too late and I would still have to complete Banishing the Echo for a third time. So the missions themselves aren't horrendous, but when you put them together into this buggy and unfair loop, that's what warrants the minus one. The last two miscellaneous points people seem to be in agreement on. Escort missions are indeed a pain, especially the one with Naja Salahim, and player support isn't as reliable as it used to be. So those are both worthy of score deductions. But the miscellaneous category isn't just for negatives. I singled out the Sandoria questline and Wings and the Goddess during the story category, but what I should have done is given the game an extra point for it, since it was so particularly notable against the rest of the story. I want to admit that I may have been trying to burn the score as low as possible in order to seem, I don't know, edgy, I guess? And also apologize for it. Let's go ahead and alter the score now, shall we? 3 out of 10. It's still on the bad range, but at least it's no longer the lowest rated game I've reviewed so far and is now in the still worth playing once range. To be honest, I never really wanted FF11's score to be so low. It is a main numbered Final Fantasy game, and I had such high hopes for it starting out. <sighs> Maybe I just played it at the wrong time. If I'd played back before trusts and extra mounts were added, Jokobo Racing would be worth the effort, and the motivation to find other players to party with would be infinitely greater. And that's the last thing I have to cover, which is also the most asked about thing regarding my review and my playthrough. Why did I play through the whole thing solo? Well, believe it or not, I have a list of reasons. One, I wanted to beat the game. I wanted to someday be able to say that I've beaten every Final Fantasy, and now that Eleven is out of the way, I am well on the path to doing so. If playing the game solo and having a harder time was what it cost, I was willing to pay. Two, I was primarily in it for the story. And since I was recording all the cutscenes, I didn't want to have to bother other groups of players while I sat there reading all the dialogue, which is also a problem I'll have to deal with in 14. Rewatching the cutscenes later is technically an option, albeit an annoying one, but that would be significantly less fun for me. I don't want to fight a boss without hearing them smack talk me first. That would be silly. And three, finding a party of people in game is practically impossible. When I needed to repeat some missions by helping others, I was using the slash shout and slash yell commands to search for players who were on those quests. But with RMTs spamming the chat, I couldn't use slash yell or my inquiry would be buried immediately. I did eventually find people, but it took hours. I can't imagine finding five randos every time I needed help killing something. And while I did make a few friends while playing, they were never online when I tried contacting them. And even if they all happened to be online and available at the same time to help me, we'd probably get through three missions tops before they'd inevitably had to leave. I'm sorry, but I can't deal with that. I would much rather have a group of people, friends, that I could contact outside of the game, like on Discord, and we could all play at the same time and beat the entire game together because that's a reasonable expectation, right? Making everyone's work schedules align? For a 700 hour game? Yeah, it just seems like I'm asking way too much of other people. Playing the game solo just seemed more... polite, I guess? I'm not sure how to phrase it. But those are the reasons I had to play solo. I want to apologize for being so overly emotional in my review. It was unprofessional of me and I hope this video will clear some things up. I also want to thank everyone who left comments, 
who critiqued the video and my way of doing things, and also the people who agreed with my points too. Getting feedback from both sides was very helpful. Hopefully, since FF11 is, supposedly, being rebuilt from the ground up in the mobile remake, we'll see improvements in at least some of the areas I covered. Even though I do not personally enjoy today's incarnation of the game, I still look forward to tomorrow's. Thank you for watching, and until next time, I'll be here, in the darkness, quietly awaiting your return.